think this is a good point in the semester for me to throw you another video. When things kind of start to get busy at the end of the term, it's good to be reminded that your professor is also a human and not a faceless online drone. So here I am. And to remind you that I am, in fact, flesh and blood like you, here are three things going on in my life right now. One is that I'm not feeling very well today. Two is that... Um, Oh, I took my daughter to her first, like, non-mommy and me gymnastics class the other day. I learned that she has no idea how to do a jumping jack. And number three... Hmm. Oh, three is that I got a new phone the other day. It's a Google Pixel, and it takes really good videos, which is what I'm using right now. Alright, so that's that on that. Let's talk about adaptation. That's it from me this week. I can't believe we're almost done with the semester. Um, I really have enjoyed working with all of you. It's been a fantastic term. Um, and to borrow a famous ending from the videos that I watch from a lot of you on a weekly basis. So, yeah. So adaptation theory is a huge topic and we're really only going to scratch the surface here. I want to help you understand a few of the intricacies of film adaptation and to introduce some of the vocabulary so that you can play around with those concepts and terms in your responses. This is an entire field of study, so we won't become experts, but I am going to try to give you enough to help you start to parse out a little bit of the process of adapting a novel for the screen. First, though, I want to explain why we're even talking about film adaptation in a class about young adult literature. Now, think back to one of the first pairs of articles we read. One woman argued that adults should be embarrassed to read YA lit, and S.E. Hinton, author of The Outsiders and also of this masterful tweet, contended that people should, in fact, read whatever the hell they want. We learned that week that young adult novels are not only popular for young adults, adults read them too. And that goes double, at least, for young adult movies. They're some of the most popular films, and they consistently top the box office charts, especially when it's like a really big one that's been popular as a novel too, like Hunger Games or the later Harry Potter books. So in some ways, we measure a novel's success by whether or not it gets turned into a film. And once a YA novel is made into a film, only rarely are actors close in age to their characters. In The Fault in Our Stars, Shailene Woodley was 23 when she played Hazel, and Ansel Elgort was 21 when he played Gus. In Paper Towns, Cara Delevingne was 23 when she played Margot, and Nat Wolfe was 20 when he played Quentin. The film adaptation of The Hate You Give just came out, and that stars 20-year-old Amanda Stenberg as Star. Um, leaving the realm of films adapted from novels for a minute, Ellen Page was 20 when she played 15-year-old Juno McGuff in Juno. And going back to the 80s, Judd Nelson was 25 when he played Bender in The Breakfast Club. Emilio Estevez was 22 when he played Andrew Clark, and Ali Sheedy, who played Allison, was also 22. In Mean Girls, Rachel McAdams was 26 as Regina George, and Lacey Chabert as Gretchen was 22. Daniel Franzis as Damien was 26, and Lizzie Kaplan as Janice was 22. So those facts alone give us plenty to unpack about the ways teenagers are represented on the screen. But that's not all we have to discuss. What is an adaptation anyway? An adaptation is anything, book, film, TV show, toy, video game, etc. that is based on another thing. So the Trolls movie is an adaptation from the, do from the Troll toys. Orange is the New Black is an adaptation of Piper Kerman's book of the same title. The movie Shrek is an adaptation of the picture book of the same title. And even if the adaptation does not look a lot like its source text, it's still an adaptation. So by the way, source text is our first vocabulary word. We use it to describe the work that an adaptation is based on. We don't say the original because almost every cultural product draws in some way on something else. You might call The Fault in Our Stars an adaptation of Romeo and Juliet, for example. Another thing to know is that, at least theoretically, an adaptation only plays the role of an adaptation if the reader or viewer is familiar with the source text. So suppose I watched Winnie the Pooh without ever knowing that there was a novel first. In that case, the film would not be an adaptation to me. In order to experience something as an adaptation, we have to be familiar with its source text. Another element of adaptation theory that I want to throw at you is a fancy little word you can toss out at family gatherings if you want to show off. It's palimpsest, palimpsest rather, 
and um, used as an adjective, palimpsestic. So the word was initially used to describe a manuscript which had been erased and then written over. And though the words that were first written on the page were intentionally erased, they would still be visible and they would still affect the way you read the text written on top of them. So imagine for a moment that you came home and you found a note on the table from the person you love. And in big bold letters it reads, Welcome home, I love you, in like thick black marker. And beneath it, you can see where a note written in pencil was erased. And it says, Hey, I think we need to talk. Can you meet me at Starbucks and maybe pack up some of your stuff first? That note is palimpsestic. Both the letters themselves and their meanings are layered. Even though that stuff was erased, it would probably still matter to you, and it might even affect the way that you read the letters in bold, and you would almost certainly wonder what happened in between. Adaptations are palimpsestic too. As long as we are experiencing them as adaptations, our readings are affected by our awareness of the source material. Now, that brings me to one of the most important points. When we discuss adaptations, the least useful thing we can possibly do is judge an adaptation based on its fidelity to a source text. The goal is to evaluate them as separate works, even while we recognize their connection. We want to figure out what factors influenced each work and to take them into consideration. So, what might some of those factors be? There are so many possibilities. Time constraints, narration, simplicity, budget, audience, rating, the list goes on. Many of those are self-explanatory, but I wanted to highlight a few for the purposes of our discussion. First, narration. That's especially relevant to our conversation because, as we noted at the beginning of the semester, YA novels are almost exclusively written in the first-person point of view. Now, how often have you seen a film told entirely in the first person? Almost never. It's not part of our cinematic convention. We've all learned how to interpret film in a certain way, and cinematographers have learned to uphold certain norms in filmmaking, unless it's experimental film. We don't really work from the first person in movies, and that's a really significant thing, because a novel that's in first person can only address what the narrator is present for, but the film can give us scenes in other places, and it completely changes the narrative. Another big element for our purposes is audience. There's often a really big difference between a novel's implied reader and an adapted film's implied viewer. We're a culture that considers a film entertainment and a book educational or time-consuming, at least sometimes. And we can expect a different group of people to read a story than to watch it, and we can expect them to do it for different reasons. So let's think about Hermione Granger in Harry Potter. She's consistently described as bushy-haired and buck-toothed in the novel. But Emma Watson is neither, and she's not made to have either of those features in the film, even though they gave Matthew Lewis, who plays Neville Longbottom, a fat suit and false teeth for some of the films. One possible explanation is that filmgoers are expected to want eye candy, so instead of having Hermione be bushy-haired and buck-toothed, they make her Emma Watson. Also related to audience is rating. When a movie concept is created from a YA film, it can go in a few possible directions. One, you could make it a family film, and now you're inviting ticket buyers of all ages, but you're probably taking out some of the content. You could direct it toward young adults with a PG-13 rating, but that's a smaller subset of the population and therefore brings lower income, and you're going to have to take out most of the swearing and sex. Or three, you could make it R-rated by including the sex and language and restricting the viewership to adults, uh, but you're limiting ticket sales and potentially also calling attention to the novel as something worthy of censorship. So there's a clear winner here in terms of real dollars. Studios are going to tend to favor the widest possible audience, so we often see adaptations reaching for a G or PG rating. So keep these things in mind this week when you watch the film adaptations of your dystopian novels. I don't want to hear a laundry list of departures from the book without any consideration of why. I know the difference between the book and the film. What could those changes mean, though, for our understanding of adolescence or other cultural constructs? I also really want to quickly touch on the dystopian future genre. It's a really rich point for examination because dystopias are written to represent potential future problems, and they often present a critique of current society. So XYZ could happen if we don't get our act together. It's no coincidence that these tend to be YA novels. 
We'd love to talk about youth being the future, and dystopian YA novels almost always feature a teenage hero. They're empowering, and they deal directly with current issues. So when you're writing your responses, try to think about what that looks like for your particular narrative. What are we being warned about? What can save the day? That's it from me this week. I can't believe we're almost done with the semester. Um, I really have enjoyed working with all of you. It's been a fantastic term. Um, and to borrow a famous ending from the videos that I watch from a lot of you on a weekly basis. So, yeah.